on two circuit switchers on this. This is, this is going to be weird. All right, guys, we're trying something new today. I've got Devin with me, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, expletive, expletive. In five, <laughs> four, three, two. Hello and welcome back to another exciting episode of DSLR Film New Podcast. I've got Devin joining me today all the way from Chicago. And uh, I myself am trying to use XSplitter and Google Hangouts simultaneously. Uh, multiple mouses and everything else. This is weird, interesting, and uh, new to me. Devin, what have you been up to, man? Uh, I've been out shooting political rallies and stuff like that. Trump and everybody, you know, uh, is hanging out in Chicago. So I've been hired to go out and do a lot of that. And I've been, um, uh, you know, loving slash hating, uh, the loggers lunchbox and working with that. And so that's, that's been an interesting project among other things. Uh, but for the most part, it's been also, uh, catching up on some animation work, a lot of, uh, motion effects and stuff like that. When I, when I'm supposed to be sleeping for the next shoot, I'm usually up trying to get projects done. So I've been a little overbooking myself, and that's completely my fault. And uh, it's a lesson I never seem to learn. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta have free time, man. You gotta always <laughs> plan in like a weekend or a break. Otherwise, you'll just go crazy with all that kind of work. Uh, on my end, I've just been uh, been trying to figure out a way to fix the live broadcast because we've been having a few issues, Devin and I, over the last uh, couple episodes. And so I'm trying out today X Splitter Broadcaster to see how that works. Uh, seems like it's doing an okay job right now. I'm able to transition to the show notes and back again with beautiful crossfades. Ooh, uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's not too bad. Otherwise, my wife is out of town. I've had the house to myself. I've been doing some product stuff for a, of all, of all places, a coffee company. I uh, wanted coffee pots and uh, utensils. Uh, filmed in various ways. So uh, thanks for that little bit of work, guys. I'm <laughs> not going to name the group, but uh, keep sending them my way. I think that's pretty boring, actually. So it's probably <laughs> time for the news. Time for the news. First up, I wanted to talk about the new Sony GM lenses. Uh, as you can see here, this is the 8514 next to the Zeiss 8514. At about half the price, we're looking at initial offerings of about $1,800. Devin, what do you think about Sony starting to compete with their number one lens provider, Zeiss, and half the price, no less? Do you think that's going to uh, change the situation for Sony Glass in general? I th Maybe. I mean, it's such a weird situation to be in because, uh, you know, n almost nobody I feel like really looks at a lot of Sony glass except for very like kind of niche situations. Like, for example, if you're picking up uh, an FS5 or FS7 for doing documentary work or something like that, and you're like, oh, I want to, you know, servo zoom, uh, then some people consider native Sony glass. But I feel like the majority of AS7 shooters uh, a7 shooters, they use adapters, they use Canon, uh, they'll use Sigmas. I just feel like Sony's so far down on that list. And then them coming out with a premier lens, like they're not going to come out with a cheap lens because it's the Sony brand, just like the Canon brand that needs to be a good quality lens. So it, the price will match it. Um, but I think in general, I don't think Sony ever felt necessarily, I don't know, may maybe, they, maybe they think the Zeiss name is dead now or something like that for the consumers. Obviously, for people on the higher end, when you're using PL lenses and stuff like that, uh, Zeiss means a lot. Uh, but in this situation, I feel like for a lot of uh, photographers and whatnot, it, it, it's like most of the, I see a lot more people with Sigmas. I still see, you know, the pros uh, out there using L series and whatnot. But I feel like uh, most people in day to day who are just, you know, making money and they don't care about image are using Sigmas and other lower cost glass. So I still feel like this is kind of, I don't know, like still missing the mark because you're coming out with a premier line of lenses with a name that right now nobody seems to care, in my opinion, about. So in that situation, I feel like it's not going to do a whole lot and it's not going to like start instilling faith in the brand or anything like that because uh, Zeiss carries weight even if, you know, it's the name's been kind of jerked through different brands and things like that. Here, I feel like 
trying to make Sony a brand like a Canon L series or something like that isn't going to work, at least not in the next couple of years. I feel well, like it's a long road. There's two things to think about when you're looking at Sony glass, and I've actually got one piece of Sony glass here. Uh, all Sony glass right now, and uh, you can see right here, this is an endless uh, focus ring. It's all fly by wire. So if you're trying to pull focus like an actual filmmaker, you want a regular lens that is capable of pulling focus with the focus ring as opposed to a fly by wire system. The GM series is uh, basically the same problem. The other issue, and actually I'll go back to the Sony glass right here, is that the Sony glass doesn't have the flange distance that you get out of other lenses. So once you're in the Sony camp, you're kind of oh, yeah. stuck. It it's with, not going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. you're never going to adapt this guy to anything else. So with that in mind, you're kind of stuck with Sony Glass in the Sony camp, and you can't transition out or around. Now, I know Sony's offering up uh, at least some good lenses, uh, some F2.8 zooms now. We're going to see a 16-35 to and a 70-200, to and even a 24-70, uh, to which is nice. But... With adapters like the MC11 from Sigma that's going to provide access to Sigma's good primes and mm -hmm. full autofocus control, those are $700. These uh, G Master fly-by-wire lenses are looking to be in the $1,800 to $2,000 range. Do you think uh, it's worth it to spend that much money in the Sony camp, or do you think Sony's going to continue to uh, thrive in the camera market? I, you know what? I feel like it's just it's throwing money in this direction because they know that uh, if they want to survive, uh, this needs to be part of their branding. Like they've they've splashed in with cameras that let's like are really cheap. You consider what you get with something like an A7S, and I feel like that is competitively priced. These lenses, on the other hand, I don't feel like are competitively priced. Uh, not that I've seen like any kind of pixel peeping charts or anything like that, but. Uh, the, I'm not seeing any necessarily uh, features like image stabilization or anything like that that's going to uh, really convince people that, hey, you're going to get features along with this lens. Well, um, the in-body image stabilization offered in the Mark II versions right, of the A7 series is kind of... That's what they're going off of. They're like, oh, we'll put it in the camera uh, and not in the lens. And then part of it is like, well, what am I paying for? Because I'm not necessarily getting a brand name. Um I, I'm not sure that I'm going to get the performance that justifies the price. So then really these are competing with Sigma. And if they're competing with Sigma, then I feel like there's no contest. So, uh, I mean, your, your uh, you know, fly by wire for the focus ring is important to video shooters. I feel like that's not necessarily important to photographers. Some photographers, sure. Uh, but a lot of photographers, you know, they, they know how to use their autofocus system in a way that they like it. Um, and when they manually need to focus, it's usually far between and there's not much of a reason to sit there and cry about uh, having something manual to uh, change on that. So I don't know. I, I feel like it's just them like being like we need more lenses because we have the, a large lineup of cameras and we don't have a large lineup of lenses that go with it. So I feel like they're building it out just for the sake of increasing the Sony brand when it comes to photography. Uh, rather than necessarily like trying to compete and trying to hit a point with it. Because there, there's always going to be those customers too who like get dedicated to a brand. Or oh, I get Sony cameras, Sony batteries, and Sony lenses, and that way I know everything is work and everything is guaranteed and warranted by Sony. There's some that do that. And I think that'll justify, you know, whatever they're spending in R&D to put this kind of stuff together. But uh, I feel like overall, yeah, there's better solutions out there for the video maker. Well, personally, I think they're actually just scrambling because they weren't expecting the A7 line to be as popular. Uh, they had the A9, or 9E, A8, A, the <laughs> A99, they had the mm -hmm. A99 system, and uh, that used the E-mount, but uh, it was further spaced, and it wasn't the, no, it didn't use the E-mount, it used the A-mount. I am, I don't yeah. know what's going on today. So it used the A-mount uh, lenses which are still the Minolta mount, but uh, it's a larger gap between the sensor and the flange. And they had a, there's actually a very good selection of lenses uh, for the A-mount camera bodies, but we haven't seen them really address the A-mount in quite some time. No new bodies really to speak of, no uh, new cameras. I was kind of expecting the A7S uh, 
specs to really fall into like a, an A mount camera at some point in the future and we just haven't seen that yet. Instead, Sony is rushing to create a bunch of lenses for the E mount series. So a little frustrating if you're a, a Sony shooter, uh, but there are a lot of adapting options out there. Although I will say still disappointed in AF in pretty much every way with both the A7S and the A7S Mark II. And I'm really jealous watching all those videos of the A6300 just knocking it out of the park with AF on all kinds of uh, different situations in low light all the way True. to you know distance and so on. It, it's amazing that that camera is doing so well in AF and uh, their top of the line cameras over $3,000 are missing out on what a $1,000 camera does. That's <laughs> very frustrating. Now, speaking of updates, the Ninja... Uh, yeah, Thomas Ninja Assassin. <laughs> okay, <laughs> first of all, why do you name your products this? This is very frustrating and, and weird for me. Every time I think of a Ninja or any of these other uh, video recorders, it kind of throws me off. But it looks like you can get these at a student price. Did you know that, Devin? No, I didn't even know that they did uh, student pricing like Adobe or uh, some of the other. I see it a lot with software, but not with hardware. So for the price of uh, looks like seven forty six, you can get these. That's about a two hundred and fifty dollar discount. If you have a student in the family or a teacher that you know, uh, you can save about two hundred fifty bucks on this otherwise thousand dollar four K video recorder. And the reason I bring it up while we're talking about Sony is simply because Sony has the A seven S Mark One, which is down in price to about. Thirteen to fourteen hundred dollars. I can't believe how fast the price has fallen off on that camera. And mm -hmm. for an extra seven hundred and forty-nine dollars, you could get four K out of your A7S. Do you think that's an attractive option over internal four K recording? Uh, I, I think I think you know it depends on the shooter because uh, there's still it's still hard to justify. I think shooting four K in a lot of situations, uh, at least especially when it comes to documentary and broadcast, when it comes to if you're documentary shooting and you're doing a bazillion, um, you know, hours of footage, then, like, do you really need 4K? Like, is that really necessary right now, considering that most of your audience can't even watch 4K? Um, and then, on the other hand, if it's, like, quick turnarounds and things like that, 1080p is a lot easier to work with, and that's what your final distribution is going to be anyway, so it's hard to justify 4K. So 4K is one of those only things I'm like... I guess if you're doing short film, student film, some kind of narrative or something like that, uh, 4K can give you some extra options in post, help you with visual effects. We all know the benefits of it. Uh, so I think, depending on the shooter, if it's a lot more documentary and video work, then an A7S and a, this 4K recorder kind of gets you the best of both worlds. If you really need to do 4K, you can drag out the recorder. Um, and so it's kind of nice to have that on hand, as opposed to... Uh, you know, paying the extra money to get internal 4K. But if all you're shooting is stuff where you need 4K, man, I wouldn't bother with an external unit at all. It's a pain in what the butt. About, what about file management? Because uh, the ProRes recording on the Ninja Assassin uh, generates pretty large files compared to, I believe, the 100 megabit uh, codec used internally on the A7S Mark II. Uh, mm -hmm. You are getting 422 out of that as opposed to 420. But... Uh, what do you do with all that data? I mean, and now we're well, talking like every hour is going to eat up maybe uh, a couple hundred gig or, or better. Uh, you know, I think really it's uh, that that is an individual workflow question. I think for the most part that uh, there's certain times when shooting ProRes and shooting those big files makes a lot of sense. Uh, for me, for example, when I green screen footage, uh, I'm usually shooting as an H.264 capture format because that's what my camera does and then I'll convert to Cineform before I edit. Uh, just because I'm doing so much visual effects work and whatnot, it really drags down. Like Premiere is really bad at seeking uh, and scrubbing H.264 footage. And you can work so much faster as an editor if you're using something like ProRes or All Intra or Cineform or some kind of built-in editing codec. So in that case, I could see ProRes being super useful uh, in cases where you would need that extra detail anyways because you're doing visual effects or you're doing something heavy. The only reason I'm actually still holding on to my Ninja 2 
is for green screen work. Uh, trying to do green screen with the footage out of a 5D Mark III is really rough because <laughs> of the edge quality. But uh, the Ninja is capable of capturing enough image resolution that it makes green screening sort of easy to accomplish. Um, now that I'm, I, I have a couple projects coming up that they basically asked for me to shoot 100% 4K. And yep. I, I, now I had to reevaluate my camera lineup and say, wait a minute, what am I going to do with my 5D Mark III? And that actually right. leads me into the sale of the 5D Mark III, which is no longer my collection. I mentioned that on uh, Mitch's episode uh, earlier this week, but I want to talk with you about it. Uh, when are you going to make the jump to 4K, Devin? Because right now you're on the, you're still rocking the yeah. GH3 yep. and uh, several Canon bodies. So mm -hmm. when are you going to try and look to the future? <laughs> try and look to the future. Uh, it's still one of those things that's really not necessary. Uh, I think for the most part. It, it, and it really depends on the client who's asking because uh, there's some clients who don't know why they want 4K and there's other clients that no matter what they ask you have to deliver. Uh, so a situation of that is I have a small business. It's like, yeah, we'd like this shot in 4K. And I go, okay. And then, uh, you know, I send them a, uh, a 1080p file and there's no complaints because they don't know what 4K is. They just know it's better. So there's situations <laughs> like that. Um, and then there's also just other... upscale it to 4K yeah. from 1080p. If, if if they're like, oh, this isn't a 4K file, then yeah, I'll upscale it because 1080p perfectly upscales to 4K. That's part of the brilliance of UHD. But, um, and to be honest, if you have a sharp enough camera, something like the GH4, which I think is still an incredibly sharp video looking camera, which we've talked about before, like struggling to getting a filmic look out of something like a GH3 because it looks so sharp and so much like video. Um, and then you, uh, there's other clients like uh, Access TV or UFC when they go, hey, for this fighter promo, we need it in 4K. They aren't broadcasting in 4K, but you don't know. They may be doing a documentary where they're going to later distribute in Blu-ray 4K uh, or something like that. But they're like, going forward, we want all of our promo footage in 4K. So, okay, let me go rent a 4K camera and shoot it in 4K then. So it really depends on what work you're doing. Uh, for me, though, it's... a you know, because it's not in a format that's distributed yet, people don't have 4K sets, minus even if they have 4K sets, they barely have a way to get good 4K. I mean, you take a look at uh, when Linus Tech Tips did, uh, uh, or Linus Media Group, they did a thing looking at YouTube and looking at 4K footage being like, when I upload 4K to YouTube, does it look good? And they realized that no, you can't tell the difference with YouTube compression between a 4K and a 1080p image. And actually, uh, for one reason or another, they because they couldn't tell the difference, they said, we'll distribute everything in 1080p, but we'll upscale to 4K because that tricks YouTube into giving our 1080p stream more bitrate. So it actually makes our 1080p look better than if we didn't upscale to 4K, which is kind of a, a, an interesting thing that YouTube's doing. But so even on YouTube, like 4K is kind of hard to justify. Uh, so in, in that case, I'm like, I'm not crazy about it. I'm probably in like the next six months or something like that. It'd be interesting to see what a GH5 turns out to be. It'd be interesting to see uh, if anyone else is coming out with anything interesting. I've still been eyeing the FS5, especially since Sony went and uh, fixed some of those uh, noise problems that they had in the camera. So I've been, I've been looking around. I've been, you know, trying to get something a little bit bigger and a little bit nicer. Uh, but yeah, it, I would say maybe in six months or so, because I know that eventually it'll become a requirement, whether or not it actually makes sense. I've had uh, now in the queue, I have three clients asking for 100% 4K delivery, and I'm I'm asking like, well, what are you what are you going to do with it? They're like, well, we don't care about it specifically, and we're still going to ask for a 1080p delivery. But in the future, if we ever want to do anything with the footage you shot, we want 4K just in case. And they're paying for it, so I'm sure. more than happy to sell off a camera and buy another camera in order to accommodate, which means I, instead of renting the A7S Mark II, I'll be buying the A7S Mark II, and I sold off my 5D Mark III for that reason. Now, you mentioned the GH5, and, and I kind of talked about this before we started the show, and Devin thinks I'm crazy. You are crazy. I think the crazy. GH5 is going to have 6K video. And I want to tick off some evidence right here because Devin thinks I'm wrong, and, and maybe I am wrong. This is all purely speculation. But I wanted to bring up one really specific point, and that is the GX8. 
If you look at the GX8, it has a 20.4, 20.8, something like that megapixel sensor. It's the first in Panasonic's line of cameras to offer a 20 megapixel sensor at uh, micro four thirds format. And not uh, that's excluding the one inch cameras, of course. Uh, so if you bring that up, uh, I talked about it. But where I'm going with this is a 6K image takes about 19.8-ish megapixels to capture. So why would they roll out a sensor in a camera that is supposed to be a subordinate to the GH4 line if they weren't going to bring that sensor over to the GH5 and include 6K recording? Also, if you look at the G7 series, that camera is basically a baby version of the GH4, and it has dropped down to $400 and maybe $60, $470 in price. Looking here on eBay, it's super affordable. I'm seeing some for $449, $469. Uh, the prices are great. So that's dropped in price, and the GH4 now can be found for $200 less than the GX8. Those three things right there are the trifecta that tell me that we're going to see a GH5 announced at NAB, and it is going to have some new feature, at least, at the very least, the 20 megapixel sensor will roll in there. But I would say they're going to up their recording capabilities to 6K, and that will keep them ahead of the pack for another couple of years. Uh, I'm also expecting, or hoping for, a Canon 5D C that will have 4K internal recording, maybe uh, 30 frames per second as opposed to 60 frames per second that they're offering in the new 1DC Mark II. And that would keep me in the Canon camp. Now, Devin, we talked about this before the show. You know all my opinions on this. What do you think? Am I crazy? <laughs> I, 6K is such, is such a <laughs> workload. Um, I think once again we run into this problem. Of, what about H.265 encoding? I know, I know. If but which it, is capable of up to 8K? Yeah. No, no. I, I and we get can still that. squeeze it into a bandwidth of 100 megabit. That'll fit onto an SD card. I know, I know. It's it's uh, it it for me. It, you're right. It teeters right on the edge of possible. I guess it's not so crazy, but it just it doesn't seem likely that I think the root of it in H.265. Uh, encoder will be put in just because of the limited support everywhere else. Uh, when you consider computers that haven't been updated from probably like six, five years ago or something like that, aren't going to be able to play this format. Uh, companies think about stuff like that. And for them, that's important. For us, we're like, it's not important. We got the newest update Premiere. We got Creative Cloud. We can, you know, edit anything. Um, well, but think they, about H.264 implementation, though. We saw that in everything all the way down to 1080p consumer-grade cameras when people were still rocking a uh, i7-920, which was barely, barely yeah. capable <laughs> of processing uh, H.264 video, and it just chugged like nobody's business. And that was out for, you know, and in consumer cameras for several years before... Uh, we started seeing computers and compatibility in Premiere and some of these other things. So you were having to transcode or really upgrade your system. Uh, don't you think they'll do the same thing with H.265? I, I think what's more likely, for some reason, I feel like I should have seen H.265 pop up somewhere else. I don't think Panasonic would be the first to bring it to market because there's too many risks and too many issues with that. But I, what I could see that would be more likely to me than H.265 is having an option where if you have an SD card in, it only shoots 4K, and if you want 6K, you need to get a micro P2. Because those two formats in Panasonic cameras are cross-compatible. Um, and I could see them doing that, being like, you could do both, but if you want to do the 6K, you need our special memory cards. I could see that happening. So I think that's more likely than an H.265 encoder, is the fact that their DSLR would start doing uh, micro P2 cards. Well, one other thing that I, and I'll put it, I have an article coming up on this, uh, <laughs> so I've been doing the research, but the other thing we see is the new SD standard, uh, V60 and V90 that are rated for yeah. 8K capture, which means, you know, that's a off the shelf uh, SD card that you can slap in your camera. Uh, they implement that standard into the new GH5 and bam, now we have the bandwidth from regular cards we don't even need. A P2 card, and I sh I cringe when you say the P2 cards because the micro P2. Yeah, yeah, they've they've been expensive and weird, and they're hard to come by, and you can't just go get them down at the store. Oh, P2 cards are the worst. Well, but there's there's good. It's just real quick because I know a lot of people hate uh, proprietary formats like P2, like you do. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though is that <coughs> while 
yes, you can argue things like hard to come by, only one manufacturer, a little bit of price gouging. The one advantage is that it works. As somebody who has a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema camera, and the fact that there's like only one manufacturer that works with it because everyone else's SD cards make promises that they can't keep, uh, it makes it where something like the red cards or the P2 cards, uh, they make sense. Like you buy this, it will work with your camera with these formats, no questions. There's no fooling with it. You don't have to test it. It just works. And there's a certain, and, and you're paying for that. But in professional video, I, to me, you know, I hate hunting after, uh, you know, SD cards that are going to be reliable, that are going to work and stuff like that. And I start worrying about things like backups and stuff. So having a super high quality media to capture to makes a lot of sense. And so I don't cringe at it, even though it's $300 for only 64 gigs. Uh, I don't cringe at it because I go, I know it'll work. Yes, it costs the money, but you look at everyone else. You, you go out like a C300 Mark II requires that compact flash 2.0. That's super expensive. I mean, it, it's multi-brand. It's not a proprietary format to Canon, but you need a special card reader. You need special cards. It's got, you know, all that kind of stuff I find really obnoxious and really expensive anyways. So if I'm going to spend a bunch of money on it, I don't know. I'd rather it be from necessarily the same company knowing that things are going to work and are you know built to work together uh it's kind of the same thing like using third-party batteries sometimes they don't work in your cameras because they're cheap and chinese so that's that's one of those things but if you buy the brand it works and it kind of goes back to the whole thing of sony those guys who like everything to be one brand so they know it works and they can rely on it so that's uh, a that's good transition devin i wanted to talk about batteries really quick because this is something devin and i have been also chatting about offline and uh, you won't find this in the show notes but it's kind of interesting to think about uh, devin was asking me about cheap options for uh, gold mount batteries and gold mount batteries if uh, you buy them from the usual suspects like anton bauer you're going to spend somewhere in the range of 300 dollars per cell uh, they're 14.4 ish volts i think that's about the price of a 90 water maybe 140 water if you find it on mm -hmm. sale but one of the things i was recommending to devin and i want to know if anybody else has tried this i've taken my batteries into a store we have here in this area called battery plus and Battery Plus basically just takes a screwdriver, pops open the plastic, yanks out the old cells, and puts in new cells, and you are good to go. Uh, basically, they warranty the batteries for 90 days or six months, whatever. But uh, the price of that battery change out is somewhere in the range of $100. So, and I was just trying to find a receipt for that because I've only done this twice. But Devin was asking about cheap options. And my thought is, what if you just go buy some bad batteries and shove new cells into them? And Battery Plus simply reads the information off the batteries and series and parallels the batteries in order to accomplish the voltage you need. Devin, is that something you would tackle? Would you go get some old like laptop lithium-ion batteries and just shove them into your Anton Bauer? I, I'm not package? even sure you'd, you'd have to sit here and gouge out a laptop batteries because, I don't know, on eBay, I can find several somewhat promising brands of just the bat the cells themselves uh, in packages in order to put them together. But yeah, that's something I would totally look at doing because it's not a big deal for me. The thing is a lot of like gold mount batteries do have chips in them that manages their charging circuit uh, because they're built in a way that you can just send 12 or 14 volts to it. And as long as there's enough amperage, it'll charge itself. You don't necessarily need an intelligent charging unit. Those, you know, that's always a good idea if you buy like the four by or the two by two charging units or something like that. So uh, get it. I know that unit is sitting there running up a spreadsheet, probably like a CSV on all the data on the battery, uh, how many times it's been charged, discharged, how long it's lasted, uh, how much load it has, and it's monitoring it so that if anything abnormal pops up, it kills the battery. And so that's to prevent it from blowing up. We are talking about lithium here. So there is a serious concern about possibly exploding batteries. And uh, in those cases, it's one of those where that's a little bit harder to swap out cells. Uh, it's something like a Sony MP battery that doesn't have any, you know, nothing to it really uh, in terms of a charging circuit or monitoring itself or anything like that. I think all it has is a temperature sensor so that when it gets too hot, it turns off. Uh, those kind of ones are super easy to pop open and replace the cells on uh, if they go bad. Uh, as for the Anton Bauer, I'm willing to try it out. I want to see if I can find a white sheet or some documentation about how to reset it. Because I'm, I'm sure when you send it into a company uh, like uh, you were talking about SwiftX or something like that, 
uh, or Anton Bauer to get your battery refurbished or warrantied or whatever, they probably have a process in which they reset those chips when they put new cells in so the battery knows that these are brand new cells and don't treat them like really old cells uh, because they'll start to, I think, uh, estimate time differently and work with them differently uh, as their like natural voltage kind but of starts the, to drop. But uh, does time, the time estimation really matter that much? I mean, you charge it up. Uh, with a generic charger, and you run it until it dies on you, and then you <laughs> run another one. I I guess, but I know that it's 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 using the I I, am, I think it's using more than just the batteries to like do line conditioning on the voltage and things like that. And I think it may actually play around with how it treats the cells in terms of what voltage it's expecting, and when it starts to report that it's low and stuff like that. I know for you, you just run them till they're dead. Uh, for me in broadcast, when like I go, okay, I have an hour long conference coming up, I kind of rely on those estimates to be somewhat accurate because I won't always have a power source near me and I'm not in a shooting environment where I can always plug in. So being like, that's part of like why you go towards an, a battery this expensive is so that when it tells you under this load, you have three hours left, you know you have three hours left. Um, and it's not, you know, a product of guesstimating and, oh, if the battery goes out, I'll just ask him to re-ask the question. You don't get those kind of <laughs> options when you're like shooting Ted Cruz or Donald Trump. You don't get an option to do a second take. So it's kind of like that's why you got to rely on this equipment to work the first time. Other shooting situations, yeah, run it till it's dead. Yeah, from a filmmaker care? perspective, I <laughs> generally will, oh, you know, the battery's about to die. And, and actually, to be honest, Evan, most cameras have a voltage detection circuit built in. So yeah. when the voltage threshold gets below whatever they're set at, you'll get the warning saying, like, yeah, I'm about to die. You know, even if yeah. the internal monitoring on the battery itself isn't working, the camera is still monitoring the voltage input source. So right. you'll get a warning anyway. And I've used a, a few times, I've just cobbled together one of those NP to... Uh, Canon LPE6 dummy batteries sure. and, and plug that in. And, you know, even though there's no real intelligence to those MP batteries, uh, eventually when the power does get low enough in five or six hours, it was like, hey, uh, guess what? I'm, you know, a warning, like the warning starts flashing. It just flashes longer because there's more capacity to those two batteries than the mm -hmm. LPE6 battery that would normally be in there. Uh, I don't know. I want to find out more about this. So, Devin, you'll have to report back on <laughs> On your tests and results, I can speak sure. only from my own experience. In that, uh, the few times I've had those batteries refurbished, you just take them in. I don't know what they do with them, but they take the cells out and put new cells in, and they work again. Mine were not the top-notch cells that uh, Devin is looking to purchase, though. They were <laughs> the generic cheapo ones on eBay, so I didn't even consider the length of time uh, <laughs> for shooting. Of course. Now, moving on down the line here, we have some adapters and if you're not familiar with these I've got one right here for you uh, this comes from uh, Kippen and this adapter basically allows you to attach Canon glass and allow for autofocus uh, Metabones also has the same option for your camera and you can do that pretty easily the cool thing though is that both companies are updating their firmware uh, so if you have a Kippen adapter or a Metabones adapter. Uh, new firmware versions are out for both of those adapters and the support has added better autofocus for longer lenses above 135 millimeters for the Kippen adapter and for the Metabones adapter they've improved the 35 millimeter f1.4 original autofocus issues. Devin are you happy or sad that we're seeing updates like this? I'm sorry, your your audio just played through twice for me, and I missed that question. Can you say it one more time? I don't know what's going on here. No, Something... I, the, the web page of the stream somehow opened itself and started playing, and so I heard you twice, and I wasn't <laughs> able to keep track of which one was asking the question. Oh, you know, I was just asking uh, a little bit of comments on the updates to these adapters. What do you think? Uh, do you think uh, Metabones is con con going to continue to support yeah, their adapter? I, because I they have this the point six one version now? as opposed to the 0.71 uh, focus reducer. Right. And with that, I haven't seen it fall off yet, but uh, do you think that's going to happen? It, mm, I don't know. Like, Metabones, I think it's – they're still holding on to I, what I think is a very strong brand. And I think and that a price. Them, Right. And I think that these updates show that they're very committed to their product, which is very important for them right now in order to keep all of their people who've spent serious money on an adapter uh, 
you know, while there some people have stopped using them because they've noticed performance problems, I think it's still seen as a go-to solution for anyone who shoots mirrorless is these Metabones adapters, especially if you're using something super small like uh, a Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera or the new um, whatever Blackmagic has. They have another pocket thing now too. Uh, so in those situations, I think it's totally crucial and necessary. And I think that them updating the firmware has shown that, hey, you can actually, um, uh, you can, that autofocus is one of those things that uh, can be adjusted after they come out with the hardware. Uh, I think in general, it's just, it's, it's a good thing for people to, uh, it, it shows that the brand is worth buying into because they don't just make a product and then drop it. Uh, they make a product and they keep trying to improve it so that it works for shooters. And like you said, when I heard that the autofocus originally was slow on it and it didn't find it half the time and everything else, that made me really question spending that much and just maybe getting a dumb analog uh, you know, the, some of the Chinese speed boosters out there that are just a lens, they don't pass electronics through. Uh, but seeing that, yeah, that they're both getting up to speed, that they start working like native glass, that makes it really exciting. And I think that returns this to an option that a lot of people should look at twice to see if this is really great for uh, their style of shooting. I've got actually two complaints about the Metabones adapter. Uh, one, I was actually about to sell it until they added autofocus, which they did, and I kept it. And I still use it on a regular basis. But if you listen to this... That is you the lens that. element in my freaking adapter that really irks me. Uh, the other thing here, if you look, it's got this this little button right here for uh, you know controlling the ring on cameras that don't power the aperture. Uh, mm -hmm. When you accidentally depress that, it locks in the aperture button, and you have to use this aperture button in order to accomplish focus changes. I mean, uh, aperture changes on there. And there's been several times where I'm just holding my lens and camera body and I accidentally push the button and then I can't figure out how to freaking change the aperture in the camera body and it's very frustrating. Those two things, I, I wish there was a way to lock that button out for cameras that have the ability to control the focus, or I mean the aperture ring in body and the rattling on this. I'm considering uh, super glue. <laughs> <laughs> Freaking, you know, sticking it in there because this part that's rattling, it's actually held in by uh, this tiny little screw right here. And that mm -hmm. screw uh, it just isn't doing a very good job. And it's you spend $695 on a freaking adapter and then it rattles. Like, what kind of BS is that? Uh, pardon my French, it just frustrates the heck out of me. So. <laughs> I am happy with uh, Kepin for uh, uh, introducing their autofocus adapter, which pushed uh, Metabones to add autofocus to their adapter. Would I like to see higher quality for the price of the Metabones adapters? Absolutely. Am I interested in the 0.61 uh, micro or reducer, the, the T version? Yes, I am. I would love to have APS-H as opposed to APS-C in my GH4. Uh, all of those said $699, probably not going to upgrade. Devin, are you going to buy one of these? Uh, no, probably not. Uh, I'm, I'm actually being really happy with my uh, Panasonic, Panasonic Native Glass. If anything, I would probably move over to uh, adapting, trying to adapt like a B4 mount or something like that because if, for me, if I'm doing narrative and I'm doing prime lenses, I'm going all manual anyway, so I'm mostly looking at Rokinon. Cines and other things that are just fully manual Nikon glass with a simple passive adapter. And uh, I, because of those prices, you know, I, I rarely need to go super wide on them that would require necessarily a speed booster. I mean, like it would if you were shooting with a black magic uh, pocket, you know, that super 16 size sensor. Uh, but in this situation, it's like it, the only time I would need this is really for photography with something like Canon glass, which is something I don't own. So since most of, I don't have full frame glass that uses this stuff and I'm really enjoying when I need autofocus and things like that uh, and image stabilization, I'm going towards native Panasonic glass and I've been happy with all the micro four thirds glass I've put on my camera. It makes it hard for me to justify this because I'm not like you and I don't have like a backpack full of Canon L series glass. Well, I do also have a full kit of micro four thirds <laughs> glass. So uh, let's not forget that. Um, I think this is a good time to move on to some hacks while we're talking about uh, this sort of stuff. I wanted to bring up this interesting hack here. And this is an, a hack for the Panasonic LX100. You can see right here, they have added 
an audio input jack by tearing this apart, basically soldering into uh, this little ribbon cable right here, which originally attaches to the onboard microphone and allows them to add a mic input to the Panasonic LX100. Now, that's one of the hacks. Uh, the other one is actually this hack right here, and this is for the 7D. It's an update to uh, the audio chip that allows you to get better, cleaner audio. The 70D. Oh, 70D, excuse the me. The DR70D, clean... yeah. Tell me about this one, because the, the LX100 is pretty much straightforward. You, yeah. you rip the body open, you hook into this microphone input right here, and you add an adapter. What are we doing with this 70D adapter? Um, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's an interesting hack and I've heard really great things with it. I haven't heard any side by side. I've been considering it cause I actually bought a U 70 D that's already cracked. So it kind of makes it a good, uh, Guinea pig for doing something like this, but you're replacing, you're essentially re replacing the preamps. You're also replacing the, uh, phantom blockers, uh, that prevent it from getting damaged or, um, uh, the phantom power. So uh, those those two things put together are supposed to, you know, uh, supposed to like bring it up to the next level. It's supposed to get it up to maybe the 701D audio standard, which is like, you know, twice the price. It's got a lot of more great features, but it's also priced to twice. Pr wow, price twice the price. So yeah, we're both slipping on our words. Yeah, today. we are. Have you so, looked at any of the other uh, op amp updates for these field recorders? Because uh, I haven't. There's a company, and I used to have one. My Fostex uh, R, uh, LR1, I believe, had an updated preamp system. And I'm trying to remember the name of the company that did the preamp update. It, it set me back, like, uh, I want to say 250 bucks. But you send it in. They do it for you, and they surface solder these operational amplifiers into the mm -hmm. circuit to provide better audio. And I'm guessing that's what they're doing with the, the uh, 70D. Is, is that right? Yeah, pretty much. They're, they're doing an upgrade to the, uh, the preamps. Uh, so it's, it's one of those that I've considered because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always, I'm never thrilled with a lot of these field recorders at these prices. DJ's like, yeah, that's the price. That's what you get. But, uh, I always hated the H, uh, the H4N. I know so many people have it and everyone swears by it, but for me, it's so incredibly noisy. Uh, it, and it's so quiet. I'm always cranking the preamp up to 90 or 100. And then it's like, you know, incredibly noisy up at those levels. And the the D, the DR40, you know, which would be the competition for it, that had some weird helicopter noise in it. So there was a lot of weird stuff in these things. And I, the, the 70D was at least a little bit of a step up, I would say, from the H4N. But it still wasn't brilliant. And I'm hoping this gives a lot cleaner sound because... Uh, without being a dedicated sound guy, it's really hard to justify $500 or $700 for a field recorder or more if you were to go more tracks with something like an H8. So I'm hoping this kind of gets me halfway there of having a pretty decent audio setup uh, while not costing me a, an immense amount of money. Now, looking online, I did find the, the company that does this, and I'll post this in the show notes for you. They have an entire list of devices that they will upgrade for you, including the Tascam DR100. Uh, they go through what they change out in the device itself. And I bet if you contacted them, uh, there may be some information on the DR70D update as well. Probably, because the DR70D upgrade is actually public information. And it has a few pictures on the form because uh, the guy who came up with it isn't charging or isn't providing a service for the upgrade. So he has released the information on how to upgrade it for free. So I imagine this company probably would know a thing or two about it if that's their bread and butter. Yeah, this is actually the Fostex uh, FR2 that I used to run for audio, uh, and it, it was upgraded. Honestly, I didn't... I'm. I, it's bad. I didn't. No, I didn't notice the difference. I like. I. I want to say that I. I did, but I didn't. I spent the money and, and I felt like it was better. And when I sold it, it sold for quite a bit more because it did have this upgrade. People, or the person that bought it was really excited about it. Mm -hmm. I personally never really noticed the difference in my audio recording. Although I will say the noise floor was uh, a little bit better. I mean, you could when you were recording a room or something like that, you didn't get quite as much of that like uh, rambling at the 40 minus 40 dB or so, but it still wasn't enough to make it 
worthwhile for the 250 or $300 I paid for the update. Uh, that said, <laughs> uh, you know, I wasn't using an audio analyzer or any of those other fancy things in order right. to determine the quality. And I'm sure, you know, they were putting in new chips into the, into the boards and changing out capacitors and stuff. There is well, and probably I'm... a noticeable scientific measurement to show you that it's better. Well, and I'm hoping that in this case, it's because the preamp and the audio device itself is so cheap and it's made with such lower price components in order to reach that price mark that an upgrade like this would actually be pretty significant to the audio. So, uh, you know, here's hoping for that. I mean, that's a little bit ways down the line, but that's kind of what I'm looking for in the future. Uh, speaking of audio hacks, uh, you were talking about the, um, the G GX7 or something like that, G7 dropped in price down to 500. Isn't there an audio hack for that to give it like a microphone port so it becomes I like a GH4? It does have a microphone input as far oh, as I know. that one does have a microphone input? It just thought... is missing the headphone output. Uh, oh, okay, th then. There are two caveats to the G7, uh, and actually we just got a question in on the G7. We'll answer that in a second. But the, the number one is the G7 uh, will not record internally while it outputs uh, via HDMI, so you can't use it with a field monitor. But it will output while you are not recording internally. So you could use it with an external recorder if you want to record 4K. Uh, sure. The other issue is that it doesn't have a headphone jack, but it does have a microphone input. And okay. I, somebody will probably correct me on this. I think it's a 2.5 millimeter instead of a 3.5 millimeter uh, mm -hmm. microphone input, but I, I could be incorrect in that. Um, I haven't looked at it in a while, so I don't know, but it's only 469. Now, the question that just came in was, should I replace my uh, Lumix G7 with a GH4, or should I take a longer look at the A6300? And I think for me, it would depend on how much you have invested in lenses. Uh, if you have a lot of Panasonic glass in your collection already, and you are heavily invested in Micro Four Thirds, it may not make sense for you to jump ship and move over to a different uh, body, because that is an APS-C sensor, so you're going to need lenses that can support APS-C, and uh, th that's not gonna be your Micro Four Thirds class. Now, if you're not heavily invested or you have a bunch of manual focus lenses like the Rokinon that, uh, that Devin uses, maybe with a Nikon or Canon mount, uh, then it might make more sense. Uh, low light capabilities, from what I've seen of the A6300, uh, doesn't appear to be too amazing. You're probably talking about 3200, maybe 6400 ISO pushing it, and I would rate the GH4 and the G7 probably good to about, what would you say, Devin, maybe uh, ISO 3200? Does that sound fair? Yeah. Yeah, I, right I, at I, the edge of the limit, maybe ISO 1600? Yeah, I mean, d d depending on, you know, and a lot of that ISO stuff depends on what you shoot because uh, with enough light, when you're really saturating the sensor, something like a 3200 ISO can actually look pretty clean uh, because your, your noise always creeps in in the shadows. So depending on how exposed your image is, if it's more evenly exposed and there aren't as many shadows, you can actually get away with a lot more ISO than most people would consider. Yeah, so I guess my opinion would be if you don't have glass... A heavy investment in glass the a6300 looks pretty sweet and and it's 4k capable has really good af um, he mentions that he's a, a wedding and music video shooter uh mm -hmm. the af uh i've already seen what th probably three music videos that have popped up that are like we only use the autofocus face detect feature in the a6300 in order to shoot this video and it did a great job and you know i've watched several of those uh they all did look very good, looked like the AF kept up really well. So it is a formidable camera. Uh, if you have a bunch of lenses though, the GH4 can be had for about 900 bucks. Yeah. Uh, so if you're looking really to go to, to 4K and you're getting rid of your G7 and you have lenses, that's a, that's a good buy. That's a, a very good buy, although you are in the Panasonic camp once you invest heavily in <laughs> Micro Four Thirds glass. I mean, yeah. you only have two choices, Olympus, Panasonic, well, and Blackmagic, I suppose, but I would yeah. put that a little bit lower on my choice list. Well, than... and, and Blackmagic, it seems they're really embracing uh, EF now. I mean, I know they started Micro Four Thirds uh, with their first couple of Blackmagic cameras, and I guess they still do on their mini studio and their new pocket cinema, uh, but all their other cameras uh, are bigger now, and they because of the size of the sensor, they're all going EF now, if not PL. So... Uh, Black Magic, like maybe one or two of the cameras. I wouldn't say it's necessarily tied to Black Magic. So, now I still am 
kind of excited about the A6300. I've I've looked at it a few times and I I almost bought it last week and then I'm like ah the you know this other job came up and I'm mm -hmm. ending up squeezing in a A7S Mark II so I probably don't need it. Because you need that 4K. <laughs> but a thousand dollars for a 4K capable camera yeah. that has surprisingly better AF than the A7 line it is pretty attractive and those sort of prices especially like the G7 priced at you know under $500 and the A6300 priced at under $1000 right kind of leads me to believe that Panasonic has to do something different with the next GH5 bringing me back to <laughs> the possibility of 6K in the mm -hmm. GH5 but let's stop talking about that and move on to these other cameras. Devin has some expensive studio cameras he wants to talk about. So tell me more about the Vericam pricing because this thing seems like a beast and very expensive. Uh, it is. It is absolutely. Uh, it, it's, it's LT, which I guess stands for little or light. But, um, you know, this is, this is more, I would say, for uh, field work that for some reason you need the higher quality the higher bit rates i mean we're talking uh wow it starts at like sixteen thousand, moves up from there um you know and that just gives you a top handle there's no evf Holy on that Holy crap, twenty-five thousand. Like that yeah yeah it goes up quickly it's now why wouldn't you buy an uh, you know an airy mini instead of this at that at those prices uh you know what it really has to do with i i know everyone looks at you know the airy brand as like it it doesn't get better than Airy, and in some cases that may be right. But uh, Vericam is actually there's there's a lot to it, and it kind of depends on the workflow and who's in charge and who's ordering equipment. Because uh, Vericam has a long history, and their vlog uh, is asynchronous across all their brands. So if you're already a studio that's been using Vericams for one reason or another, you'd pretty much want to stay in the, uh, that camp. It, it is an option to consider compared to things like, uh, you know, reds or something like that. And it's very similar to one of those cameras where you want to look at building it out or versus the era mini. Uh, but you know, you're starting to get things that, you know, look really interesting. You're getting 240 P slow-mo, uh, which yeah, we've seen out of, uh, cheaper Sony's, but being able to shoot, um, like ProRes four, 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 uh, slash HQ. Uh, as well as uh, supporting Codex, AVC, all intra as 444, 422, whatever fits. Um, so part of it is that it does do that internal recording. It'll do 60p at 4K. Uh, so there's there's a lot of things like that to consider as well. It's uh, it's just one of those that, yeah, you know, then they advertise 14 plus stops of dynamic range like everyone else. What that really means in the real world is usually quite a bit different than uh, their scientific testing. But it's one of those that for me would be an exciting camera to shoot with. Uh, maybe I'm one of the only guys who kind of likes the Vera cams, uh, but it, it also is super adaptable because not only can this be like, Hey, throw on your PL glass or your Canon L series glass and do some kind of fancy cinematography. Uh, they usually include a lot of uh, plugs and adapters so that you can do uh, power servo zooms you can crop in on the sensor and you can run a uh, b4 mount news eng lenses and whatnot so how is it there's... weather because i'm looking on the side here and i'm seeing a very huge vent fan right there on the side of the camera body you think this will handle you know rainy and uh, adverse conditions uh, no uh I, I think um and why isn't I'll... it made out of carbon fiber why is it right uh I think for the most part, no, it, it's that, you know, anything past light rain, I'd be seriously concerned like any other camera. Uh, a lot of cameras don't handle weather that great. I know our DSLRs do, and that's because things like the 5D are meant to be in adverse conditions and not have to have something draped over the top of it. When it comes to video cameras, though, it's usually not uncommon to encase them in some kind of uh, a bag or something like that. Um, and I'm sure somebody will make custom bags for this uh, kind of camera, though, anything that fit a red would fit this. In any case, uh, it's one of those that, like, ah, it's, it's something, you know, I dream about at night. It's, it's an exciting camera. It's one of those that I'd love to go out and shoot around and play with, but I couldn't justify uh, even renting it to play around with it because after you add on things like the EVF and everything else, you're talking about 25 grand. So, but it is one of those that if, you know, uh, you're a higher end shooter or you're buying an on location camera for a studio or something like that. This one gives you a lot more flexibility for the same price as one of those normal ENG shoulder mounted cameras. And it's also giving you a smaller size. So 
there's quite a few uh, advantages to these cameras and I could really see this as being one of those things that helps to push uh, traditional ENG cameras from Panasonic and Sony out of the market, just like, um, uh, like I said, CBS looking at the Sony FS5, well, a modified version of the FS5 yeah. to be their new go-to camera. I think that uh, because these things are becoming adaptable, they'll run as a smaller size sensor if you need them to. They'll crop in on themselves, so they'll support any kind of glass you can fit on it. I think that ha cameras having that kind of flexibility uh, at this low of a price point really kind of makes, you know, they're trying to make one camera to rule them all. I know we always say that the, there's never just one camera. Uh, but if money is no object, a camera like this that is pretty small, pretty portable uh, can give you a lot of, can be very advantageous in a lot of different situations. So uh, that's something to consider. I think it's cool, uh, but, you know, it's one of those that uh, that I may be the only one who's really interested in Veracams because I know Veracams are not Aria Lexus. They don't have the prestige that comes well, with their brand. It's just uh, since Aries started releasing the, the Mini, which is a, a very affordable, smaller version of right. their full-size camera, it's, it, that becomes the rental option of choice. I think last time yeah. I priced a rental out for that, uh, I want to say it was like $2,000 for a, a week or $3,000 for a week, so it's not horrible. Yeah. Uh, you know, you still have to, I mean, that's expensive. Don't get me wrong, but th that's, <laughs> yeah. but that's not as bad as you think it would be. And, mm -hmm. you know, red packages are still like, I think it's 4,000 for a, a week. And that includes the, you know, the EVF and a screen and the media. So, you know, not the worst thing in the world, but, uh, I don't know. Uh, this camera doesn't excite me at all. Nothing really exciting here for me, but this next camera also doesn't excite me either, and I'm going to show this right now. Devin, tell me about the AJPX230. I thought Panasonic already had a M43 version of this. It seems like I remember a red camera, you know, a camera that was colored red that had yep. a micro four thirds yep. sensor in it. What is yep. this, and where does it fit in their lineup? You know what? I feel like this is, uh, you know, a kind of thing that kills their lineup. I think something like this that doesn't have any outstanding features compared to uh, what JVC is offering and a lot of other things. Uh, it, it uses Micro P2, which a lot of people won't be happy about the high priced uh, proprietary media. It will do uh, some kind of log code. It's got a 22x optical. I'm sure that if you line them up side by side, you'll notice very slight differences. Uh, but it's still a one-third inch sensor, um, and you know it's still only doing 1080p as opposed to their 4K camera, and it's still priced up there as if it's their 4K camera. So I don't know exactly what this is supposed to replace, what this is supposed to represent in their lineup, because it's not offering anything new or interesting besides like, oh, you know, variable frame rates, which we've seen before. And, oh, hey, look, a really nice OLED EVF and LCD panel. That's nice. But those are all like minor upgrades to a 1080p camera when they're offering 4K cameras with, you know, twice the features uh, for, you know, roughly the same price. I think it's, I don't know what they plan on doing with this. Well, it's speaking really... of JVC, man, I mean, look at this right here. This is the JVC uh, easily named GYHM170UA 4K cam, and it is a $1,200 camera with a XLR inputs. Obviously, it's not quite the camera that the it doesn't come with a, a an extra boom mic. I suppose uh, this would probably fit more in range with uh, what Canon is offering in their XA25 range. But uh, this is full fledged, capable of shooting 4K, and the price 100 or $1,295. So a quarter of the price of that Panasonic unit. How does that stand up against, you know, a 1080p camera? It seems right. like we're, we're kind of past that in the lineup, right? No, and, and I mean, you compare the fact that they've already had uh, the PX270, uh, which is another micro P2 camera, uh, though that one will shoot on SD cards. Uh, that does, you know, Ultra HD for a thousand more or so, like 1,200, 1,300 more. Uh, it makes it go, why are we announcing, you know, a, a standard F camera? It it just, uh, it doesn't make sense. I feel like this is one of those where the company, a big company like Panasonic feels like they need to have a camera for every single price point instead of focusing on just a couple of cameras uh, that are uh, at aggressive price points and focusing on making them 
uh, the best because this is where they kind of build one model. I wouldn't be surprised if the 230 is just a 270 with software in it that limits the Ultra HD recording because, you know, and, and, it's, and then they just sell it at a slightly cheaper price because I'm sure that that's what's happening. They go, oh, no one wants to buy our UHD camera. We'll come out with a cheaper version of it. What feature are you going to cut out? Oh, we'll cut out the 4K. You know, and it ends and you're up like, what? Why? Why would you cut that out? It, it's, <laughs> it's well, because it's the exact same body. I'm sure it's all the same internals. I'm sure really there's nothing different between these two cameras. Um, they're just they're like, hey, we could, you know, and then, hey, Panasonic released a new camera today and we're in the news. I'm sure it's a big kind of corporate big picture kind of thing going on here. Uh, but it's just really confusing. And I th I think personally for a lot of professional shooters, uh, it's bad for the brand when, you know, you release cameras that aren't pushing something like even if this oh this had some kind of crazy feature where oh you could you know strap on a heart rate monitor and it'll play the heart rate in the corner of the screen while you like you know uh, some football player runs down the field i'm like <laughs> okay that's a useless feature but at least like that justifies why you're you know releasing something uh this on the other hand just looks like hey look we took a step back and made another camera so well, that's disappointing. It uh, is disappointing. When you see innovative stuff for Panasonic, like the GH4 and G7, and then you have these more expensive cameras that are... It looks like... I'm looking at the retail price now. Uh, I don't know which one you linked to, but uh, it looks like uh, without the $1,000 mail-in rebate that they're offering, it's actually 5750 which puts it into the price range of a freaking that's Sony... That's for the 270. That's for the, oh, that's 270, for the 270 that does 4K. That's the oh, 4K okay, version. okay. So the 270 with the rebate is going to be mm. the same price as the 230. I believe well, close to no, because the 230 I thought was uh, looking uh, at the 230. It is what are we sitting at here? It looks like we're sitting at uh, four thousand dollars. Yeah, four thousand dollars. So, so seven hundred and fifty bucks will get you to the 270. We'll get you 4K, and I'm sure that's exactly what they want it to look like. So then. I, I, it could be a big corporate thing. Like they're like, so then when people search for a Panasonic handy cam, they go, oh, well for 750 more dollars, I can get 4k. And now they're starting to buy the more expensive camera. So I don't know. I I'm guessing this is marketing and that's the reason why it's here because otherwise I can't figure out why they would bother with this. Wow. That's weird. <laughs> that's, uh, that's sad. It is that's sad. very sad. Panasonic <laughs> do better. Do better, Panasonic. Do better. Be more like your cousin, JVC, They're putting out yeah. weird, wacky stuff that I probably won't buy, but I like the look and style of. All right. I think that's about it for the show notes. So this has been a pretty slow mm -hmm. week for news. Devin, do you have anything else to cover before we get out of here, man? Uh... No, not not at all. I've I'm you know I, I'm we're both pretty head. worn out today. Uh, we've been working a lot. Devin's you can tell he's yeah. tired, poor guy. <laughs> and uh, I've been coughing off camera as much as possible, but uh, my bronchitis is still holding in there strong. I love being <laughs> sick. Uh, thank goodness for that. All now right, I can on that see note, why she left the house. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> my wife is out of town. I have the house to myself, and uh, I just lay on the floor coughing all day. Uh, <laughs> Devin, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me at, on Twitter at DevoCut. And, of course, guys, you can find this podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, and anywhere podcasts are distributed. I, of course, am DJ, and you can find me at DSLR Film Noob at DSLR Film Noob on Twitter and DSLRFilmNoob.com. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe to all the things that come out of this podcast, and be sure to leave your comments in the YouTube section because that helps us direct the show. Uh, let me know what you think of this weird switching thing we're trying out here. We might advance it. We might not. I just wasted 40 bucks on uh, X Split in order to uh, be able to do this. So I don't know if it's worth it or not, but uh, it's kind of fun. And I can switch over to this with a nice crossfade and say thanks. We'll see you next time on another episode of DSLR Film Noob Podcast. And that's it for the audio listeners. Jeez. That is... It's been so long since I've been on the podcast. It always feels like a long time. You Sometimes, skip me every other week. <laughs> sorry about that, Devin. We don't, <laughs> no, we don't right. try to skip you. It just uh, Some weeks it just doesn't work out quite right for my schedule and your schedule. Yeah, and then, I know. You've been pretty busy lately, man. Uh, I, I think know. one of those skips was my fault. 
And yeah. we, a couple of them were you had some schedule changes and then my days didn't work out because of That'd it. That'd be fair to say, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> it happens. Uh, plus, honestly, guys, if you're still watching after that, uh, there was not a lot going on this week. We, there's a couple yeah. cameras like that that last uh, JVC that we – or um, JVC. That last uh, Panasonic camera that we talked about, I just have nothing exciting to say yeah. about that at all. There's it's like it's such a disappointing – camera and and actually honestly i've been spending most of my time dinking around this weekend since i have a little bit of spare time with uh, these adapters um i went out and shot with nothing but a 24 and a 50 millimeter f12 on my gh4 uh just to see how that would go and honestly uh as far as lenses go i'm still even though i don't own any more canon bodies i well, actually, I do own. I, I own the 6D and the T2i, which Mitch pointed out you own more than one, DJ. He's right. Uh, but the glass, Canon's glass on the GH4, especially with the Metabones adapter, it does look really good. Uh, mm -hmm. I was just shooting with this, and I enjoyed it. Uh, the look of it has a little bit more contrast, a little bit better colors than some of the uh, Micro Four Thirds lenses I've been using. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. the I've been shooting with the... Uh, the 15 millimeter f17 panasonic lens and it, it is phenomenal it looks really good but it doesn't quite catch up with these thousand fourteen hundred dollar lenses from canon especially with the metabones adapter they, they start to look really good uh, i don't know I, i'm i think i'm gonna hold on to all my canon glass Devin, do you think i'm i'm crazy to hold out for a, a uh, 5d no, mark because mark four um I imagine it's not going to do anything in the video market that's very interesting. You don't uh, think we'll see 4K or anything like that? We we might see 4K, and then part of the question is how good is the 4K uh, compared to a lot of other it's options? It's probably going to be a motion JPEG. It's going to be trickle-down features from the original 1DC. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, expect they, all the same issues that were in the original 1DC. I mean, t maybe to keep it interesting, they might do something like, hey, we'll give you 10 A headphone raw. jack? Yeah, right. We'll give you 10 AP raw. I could see them doing 10 AP raw before they do a headphone jack, which sounds stupid, but... Well, I, they, I think... They want to keep that camera tucked away as, oh, it's your B camera for your C300 or something like that. They... They want to keep it right in that in that price point and right there. So I don't imagine it going anywhere. So or being interesting or any of that stuff. Next question for you, since we're we're done with the show and we're still kind of just a little bit mm -hmm. extra. Are you actually going to do the DR70D hack yourself? Or are you going to try and do su surface mount soldering? Yeah, surface mount solder. I have a soldering iron. Surface mount can't be that hard. Well, uh, you just so, use less solder, right? Well, no, no. <laughs> you you have to evenly distribute the heat in order to peel those off. Mm -hmm. Do you have any dental tools or anything? Because you're going to need those. No, nah, I got tweezers. That's all I need. Tweezers? <laughs> yeah. All right. I don't know. I'm, <laughs> I'm seriously considering the, uh, the hack here. This, For the uh, LX100? The LX100. Yeah. Uh, the LX100, I've been, I've been shooting with it quite a bit lately, and uh, it does a great job in 4K video. And the only thing it's lacking is uh, is an audio input, and you have volume control for the built-in, uh, you know, microphone on the unit. So if you bypass that and put an actual 3.5 millimeter jack in there, I mean, mm -hmm. now you're sitting pretty pretty decent in this little camera. Good lens, and uh, they're around four fifty five hundred dollars. And what is that beeping? I do not is that know what you, that is? I think you have a fire. Uh, a uh, fire detector that's it batteries could be. dying. I mean, the or something. doors, the doors close, but the carbon monoxide detector is right outside the door. So it's you're not going to die like on a low battery. You? It sounds like a low battery. No, I mean, I I don't know. I've been slurring a lot on the podcast, so maybe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, that hack I was talking about earlier actually was for the GH4, not the GX7. And what it does is it takes that flash port on the front okay. uh, and changes that to the headphone jack so that the headphones don't get in the way of the flip out screen. And then I think ideally to complete that entire hack, I would reroute the microphone. I don't know about the USB or the HDMI port, but I'd reroute the microphone up through the flash because it's not like if you use it as a video camera, you need the flash anyways. And then hook that up into like a top handle off of the cold shoe, off of the structure of the camera. So that that way 
you can plug headphones into it. You can plug a microphone into the top of it, and your monitor can still flip and spin around on the side of it. You know, you lose that ability. just until you mentioned that, I forgot that there was even a flash on the GH4. It's uh, yeah. It's been so long since I um, actually looked at it. Yeah, yeah. Th- there's a little tiny button here. If you push that, it actually pops <laughs> yeah. up the flash. It did did and not it, know that. Uh, not yeah, something I there's, actually there's use. No, there's no point to it because uh, even if you're doing photography, that onboard flash is never useful anyways. Well, so. you could do uh, – they have those like little bounce no, adapters and stuff like that. You can do diffusers. Like Usually what I do, which I've done in a pinch, and it kind of works, is um, uh, set up a mirror or um, – uh, other small, like, get, like, a note card, maybe, and yeah. I'll put, like, that's black on one side. And so rather than using it as a as a diffuser, I'll use a mirror to sit there and bounce the fla- uh, flash right behind me, and I'll stand up up against a white wall, and then I'll have them come towards me, and I'll shoot it that way. So I use, like, a big white wall as my diffuser. But I actually have I, those weird strap-on uh, oh, yeah? flash diffusers, the big squares, and uh, they do a pretty good job. Uh, yeah. I have a whole set of, of 580 EX2s that I used to use with my 5D Mark III for, uh, you know, inside shooting. But, uh, you know, a lot of the generic Yongio uh, flash heads yeah. will work with both Canon and oh, yeah. with, uh, with uh, Panasonic, which but is... But I will, I will say, I, I know they do, and they're well-priced, and I hear that they're good pieces of tech. I, I didn't buy it. I just happened across... Uh, for my D90, a Nikon Speed. Yeah. And having those hooked up wirelessly is some of the most fun I've had photography-wise because there's just, like, nothing I had to do. I just set it into the A group, set up the flash, and now the two were, like, wirelessly linked. And so... Yeah. Actually, just... man, I don't know if you've seen them, but Yongio has their... I know, uh, wireless adapters. Their wireless the adapters that yeah. are all ETTL supported, and they're super cheap. They act as a, as a slave and as a master for all of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they broadcast uh, IR for Canon stuff, uh, as well as Nikon stuff, and they're wireless. And you can really, you can go crazy uh, with those in A, B, and C, and D... Uh, yeah. units so you can fire off certain flashes for one uh, setup and then certain flashes for another setup yeah and actually um i was at a convention uh like this was like four years ago and i, I the reason i bought that setup was uh i had to run a photo booth there uh, i was volunteering or no i wasn't volunteering i was getting paid but uh, um <laughs> i had to run a photo booth anyway and i wanted to get two shots simultaneously so i didn't want people to walk away before i had two different like lighting scenarios so you just hit a shoot it one way hit B and it switches over to the other set of flashes and gives you like a front and a backlit and then you're mm-hmm. done and you never have yeah. to freaking dink around <laughs> with anything. It was amazing. It blew my mind. It was just so, so nice to do. Yeah. No, it's, it, it's a lot. I want to do more flash photography. I just haven't run into excuses to do it because I don't get paid for photography. So yeah. All right. <laughs> uh, the, on that sad, sad note mm-hmm. of flashes, I think I'm going to end the live broadcast now. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Pew.